Okay. All right. Brennan Lee Mulligan is the best dungeon master. That's the end of the video. Bye. <laughs> I think Brennan Lee Mulligan is probably one of the best DMs there are, and running one of the best D&D shows. Definitely one of the highest budget D&D shows there are. Every single combat has these meticulously crafted set pieces and the whole show itself is so entertaining and the production quality is so high. I do not envy Brennan Lee Mulligan though because all of the combats are pre-planned and these set pieces and minis that they make have to be pre-arranged, which means you can't really just improv things. The story has to lead to the combats which tie into the next part of the story, which tie into the next part of the story. It is role play combat, role play combat. You gotta be running a really tight ship when you're running for a show like Dimension 20. It's really important that you hit those plot points because you want to use these really expensive minis and these really expensive terrain pieces. Now, Brennan could easily just railroad his players because come on, it's a show. Gotta hit the combats, we gotta make sure we get there. But Brennan doesn't railroad them. Brennan runs a pretty open world setting, and yet the players still follow the plot. How does he do that? How is he able to get the players to follow the plot that he has lined up without railroading them? Brennan is pretty skilled at motivation, getting the players and the player characters motivated to follow the story. Getting the players motivated, getting the characters motivated, you're going to find are two different things and we're going to get to that. The first technique that Brennan uses to motivate the characters is with their backstories. Each character, if you go through the backstories which are established in episode one, he takes the time to flesh out what their backstories are. Each of their backstories has some sort of complication within it. They have some sort of rivalry. There are some sort of expectations that they're trying to fulfill, or maybe they're, they're struggling with their identity somehow. Whatever the complication is, Brennan uses the resolution of that complication as a way to entice and motivate the characters. All Brennan has to do is take the resolution to that complication, tie it in with the main story, and all of a sudden the players and the player characters are very interested in following the main story because within the main story is the promise of resolving the complication within the backstory. That is what motivates the characters. Motivating the players is a different story. This is the second method that Brennan uses and it is using the character archetypes. All the PCs in Fantasy High follow some sort of high school themed archetype. There's the jock, there's the prep, the nerd, the punk, they all follow a sort of prescriptive idea of a character type. You can look at a character and you can tell what inspiration that character takes from. This isn't done on accident. This is very much done on purpose by the players. The players made this character with this archetype in mind because they knew while they were going to be playing this character, they are going to try to fulfill that archetype. So that's kind of the fun of role playing is to try to be someone you're not. And the easiest way you can be someone you're not is by trying to fulfill the archetype that you are not. As a DM, once you've figured out what archetype the player character is trying to fill, all you need to do to motivate them is offer them chances to fill that archetype. Is the character a private detective? Give them a mystery that they can solve. Is the character a jock? Give them a sports team that they can try to defeat. This is what Brennan does. He embraces the archetype that the character is going for and then uses a chance to fulfill that archetype and ties that in with either the backstory or with the main plot. The backstories are already tied in with the main plot, so no matter which way you hook it, it's going towards the main plot. Think about how you can put this into your game. You may have characters who you don't even know what archetype they're trying to fulfill is. You may have players who they don't even know what kind of archetype they're trying to fulfill, but it's there if you look hard enough. If you try to find characters in media that you can kind of cross-reference the characters that they made, you'll be able to find some semblance of an archetype that they can fulfill. And let me tell you, once they fill that archetype, archetype, it feels really good. It, it feels super cool to know that you are playing the private detective, that you are playing the punk rocker. You don't want to be a sucky jock. You want to be an excellent jock. And so letting your players be the peak of their archetype makes it feel like they kind of succeeded at making their character. Brendan Lee Mulligan is a master at this, especially when you mix that with the backstory. It is the 
motivation of backstory with the method of archetype. So you fulfill that complication. Like let's take a look at Fabian as an example. Fabian is a jock and his backstory is that he's trying to make his father proud. So he is going to make his father proud by being really good at the Blood Rush team. And now his motivation for the rest of the game is going to be trying to get into the Blood Rush team. And then Brendan Lee Mulligan ties in getting into the Blush Road team with the rest of the main plot. The Blood Rush team are actually part of the villains. And now Fabian is motivated to follow the main plot. And Lou is motivated to follow the main plot as well because he wants to fulfill that archetype that he had in mind when he made Fabian. Take this dude with the other five characters as well and you have a full motivated party. This is just when it comes to planning the campaign out. Brendan is also really good at role playing. You can tell that the, the, the players on the show have lots of fun when they're role playing with Brennan. How are they doing that? How is Brennan letting them have so much fun with role playing with his NPCs? When NPCs are put in front of the player characters, Brennan uses the NPCs not really as ways to show how good he is at role playing. He uses NPCs to try to develop the other player characters. Characters. He uses NPCs as methods for the player characters to express the emotions and thoughts and beliefs, personalities of the other player characters. He does a thing where when you want someone to like you, so you ask them like a lot of questions about themselves because people like to answer questions about themselves, people like to talk about themselves. Brennan does that just with his NPCs. As an example, take a look at the party talking to the AV club. Brennan has the these really cool NPCs. What does Brennan do with these NPCs? Brennan uses these NPCs to try to gleam what the player characters are like. How do they interact with people that they think are weird? How do the player characters ask for help? How do they react when someone they don't like starts to come on to them? Brennan doesn't just sit and wait to be role played with so he can show how cool his NPCs are. No, he uses his cool NPCs to try to show how interesting and developed the player characters are. This is something you can do in your own home games. Don't use your NPCs as just ways to show how cool you are at role playing. Use your NPCs to try to dig for more depth into the other characters, into the other player characters. This is also kind of the same category where you see Brennan's improv skills shine. Brennan is of course great at improv. He uses the infinite wisdom of yes and to make his games better. You hardly ever see Brennan saying no to the players unless there's like a really specific reason and why. This shows in like really small things, flipping off the back of a motorcycle or headshotting enemies, doing cool finishers, a lot of unorthodox moves in combat, or just unorthodox moves out of combat. Typically, if the players want to do something, Brennan is their number one fan in doing that thing. And of course, doing this makes his players feel extra cool, and it makes the story a bit more spectacular. The players aren't just tripping over themselves. Brennan knows what the characters are good at and he lets them succeed at things. This could be something you can include in your game right now. Just whenever there is swashing and or buckling in your combat, let the players do it. Let them swing from the chandeliers. Let them do the flips and let them do the things that are just extra crazy. Your game is going to be more fun that way. Which leads me to how Brennan runs combat. And let me tell you, the combats on Dimension 20 are insane. If you've watched Dimension 20, you know that they do combat a little bit differently. In most D&D games, you have a lot of combat sort of spread out amongst the whole campaign. No, Brennan takes all the combats and puts them into one massive battle. Every other episode, there are these deadly insane combats where there's like 10 different things going on, which is a lot different from how combat normally happens. Most of the time I notice in D&D the player characters go into what I call cantrip mode where the player characters don't want to spend any of their resources so they do whatever doesn't spend spell slots or class abilities so you know they use their cantrips their basic attacks and they just kind of roll until all the enemies are dead. This is because Players are trying to conserve their resources. They want to wait until it becomes important to use all their class abilities. This makes your games boring. It's just kind of rolling until all the enemies are dead, turns all the fights into just trivial ways of just waiting for the enemies to die. Not with Brennan. Not when there are thousands of audience members tuning in. No, Brennan puts on a spectacle. Brennan makes all of his fights so insane and chaotic that the players have no other choice but to use all of their abilities and even 
then there's still just a slight chance that they will win. I mean, these combats are so insane that Brennan has them level up after every single encounter. This also makes it so that they have new abilities in every single encounter, and every single encounter is different for the player characters. And also, it just feels great to use your combat abilities. I mean, it, when you get to use your class features and all the new spells that you get when you level up, that just feels great. But as a player, you want to conserve those abilities. You want to wait until they matter. Well, guess what? In Dimension 20, every combat matters. There's no point in conserving your resources. After every single fight, there is going to be a long rest, and these fights are deadly, so you better use your abilities. Every single fight is a desperate triumph against an overwhelming enemy. And they're important to the story too. It's not like they're just fighting for no reason. Every single fight has some string of events that gives them the reason as to why they're going into this fight. These combats aren't just difficult because there are a lot of enemies. No, Brennan makes the combats more difficult by adding in layers of complexity. He makes the battlefields more dynamic. He adds extra elements that give complications to the fight. There's some kind of ticking clock or a giant monster in the fight that isn't loyal to either the enemies or the party. Every single fight, there's some kind of moving battlefield or a separate objective that the players can do. Fights aren't just hitting the enemy until they're dead, it's also making the choice between fighting the enemy and doing the secondary objective or the third objective or trying not to die from the moving battlefield. Like in the cafeteria battle, right? Brennan could have just had the players fight against the lunch lady warlock and all the little corn minions, but no, Brennan also added a giant corn monster that wasn't attacking the players, but was creating more minions and was trying to move its way towards the pantry. Now, a giant monster made out of food, trying to accumulate more food, it doesn't take rocket science to know that that monster is going to become more powerful once they get more food. So now the players have options. Do we go for the minions? Do we go for the lunch lady warlock? Or do we go for the massive monster that is looking to grow in size? Britain knows the more options he gives the players, the more choices they have to make, the more engaging the battle becomes. Each addition to the combat, each layer of complexity gives the players something to think about. Not only are they thinking about like what the most optimal thing to do is, but they're also thinking about what their character would do in this situation. Just giving them choices just lets them play the game a whole lot more dynamically than just a room of four orcs. If you want a masterclass in campaign design and encounter design, then you should check out Dimension 20. After you watch my videos, of course, those are also pretty good. In fact, you should probably subscribe so you don't miss any more videos. <laughs> if you think this content is actually really good, so good you want to give me money for it, I have a Patreon. It's only $3 a month and you have access to the exclusive D&D campaign that I'm running for all of my patrons. All of the patrons are on screen right now. <laughs> um, all of the D&D campaigns I'm running is on the Dice Brain Discord. There will be a link in the description. I run one shots for anyone who's on the server, patron or not. So if you want to be able to participate in those one shots that I'm running, you should check out the Discord. If you think this video was good, you should check out how to write a campaign from levels 1 to 20. There's a video I made, it's going to be on the screen right now. The techniques in this video and the techniques in that video, you put those together, you're going to run a pretty solid campaign. Aside from that, the, the video is over. So you can watch that other video now. We're all done here. Bye.